The views and opinions on where did the road go belong to those making them. Do not mistake allowing freedom of speech for agreement. This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by seven amazing individuals. Greg Ross, Bill Luminati, Allison Cook, no one. Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, and Michael Frisky. Thank you all for helping to make this show possible. And if you'd like to help out, become a patron at wheredotheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month for lots of extra content. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have with me Mr. Red Pill Junkie. Buenas noches. Mr. Mike Cleland. Greetings, everyone. And a cryptid, an actual cryptid, uh, by the name of Joshua Cutchin. Uh, <laughs> he's, very, he's very hard to find, but we found him, and here he is. You know, after after having been on so many other shows since I was on Where Did the Road Go last, it really does feel like coming home, so thank you. I, I appreciate it. This, this is my once-in-future home uh, for podcasting, and it's always a good chance to catch up with you guys. Yeah, but our, our conversations have, over the last few months have been, hey, Josh, when do you have some time? Oh, like next month? <laughs> and then I don't say anything until next month. And then I'm like, so I never got back to you. Do you still have this month free? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, we, we've been doing some, uh, some switching up with the way that we do things in the household. And uh, among other things, I am writing and playing music full time, which, uh, awesome. which is something I never thought I would do. But oh, uh, I'm God very bless grateful you. for the opportunity and. Here we are. <laughs> well, it's also that, you know, I wait until much like you respond to me and I don't respond to you right away because that's what I do. Well, that's and, what I do too. So it's like the worst of both worlds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Every once in a while, I was like, Josh hasn't responded to me. I should poke at him. <laughs> but anyway, you're all here. And yes. this is saying we've been planning on doing for at least a half a year. Um, I'm thinking at this point, you both have, well, Mike, you and Joshua both have fiction books out. And the thing about these books is that they do have some similarity in, uh, I guess, tone, right? Would you call Correct. it tone? So I, Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, I have not read Josh's massive 500 page book yet. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm still working my way through his like 900 uh, page massive. other book. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, I have read Mike's book and I loved it. And but Red Pill you, has read bo- both books. And yeah, I don't. Josh I don't know if I still them. remember them. <laughs> <laughs> and and Mike has looked at every single page of of <laughs> Josh's true. book. Scrutinized them with a with an eagle eye for for, for yeah. So <laughs> I'm actually, and I will say, I'm very proud of that book. I did everything on the inside, the stuff on the outside, in a few places, on, and not quite everything on the inside. But um, but I did the inside, and and uh, Red Pill Junkie did the outside. No, my uh, Mike creates beautiful. He turns books into beautiful artifacts, and um, you know the the thing that I I always say about um working with Mike is the the best thing about Mike is how detail oriented he is, and the worst thing about Mike is how detail oriented <laughs> he is. Uh, and I say that with all the love of my heart. But sometimes I'm like, Mike, I I hired you because I trust you. Do what <laughs> do what you do, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it, it's been a great relationship, and um, the fact that I'm able to you know help uh, to collaborate with someone uh, like Mike is just an absolute pleasure every time. My my goal in this is that the the people self publish books, and for me, like I've been to conferences and I've seen self published books. Since you hold a self published book in your hand, and I and for the most part, you know instantly that it's a self-published book you can look at the first page you can Mm -hmm. open it anywhere and you go oh oh i get it this is a self-published book and and it is simply the the art direction on the interior is terrible you know there's a there's a very high standard that has been set by professional art directors who have done high quality book layout and my goal is that anyone opening that book will not know it's a self-published book and they will treat it as a as like a real book that was published by a high-end publishing house, yes, and and they because it has that that look and and it's not that complicated to do, but you do have to 
be mm-hmm. very nitpicky about tiny, tiny, tiny little details. Yeah, no, and, and, and I mean it when I say all the love in my heart, because since working with you, Mike, I, I noticed things, I noticed aspects of books that I'd never had before, like the gutter and placement of certain things and whatnot. And I could not be more thrilled with the way everything we've done has turned out. So please don't think I was, <laughs> I was trying to be snarky. I was, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I meant I, as a compliment. <laughs> I, I, I'm from New York. I, re- I know real snark from the face. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I, enough. um, I have received self-published books before where I'm like, this is hard to read Ooh. because it's formatted so poorly Ooh. and sometimes not even proofread on top of that. Mm-hmm. I don't do them. Proofreading is I, that's not my. I, I I'm no. the worst. So every every detail that I as I, uh, I like I'm the worst speller. I have every, I make every punctuation mistake. Uh, <laughs> uh, Joshua did a first read through of my book, and I I can't. I think he sent like I'm going to guess roughly a hundred sentences that he caught that were questions. Like John <laughs> asked, and then the question it didn't have a question mark. It had a period at the end. So that is pretty simple as far as you know. That's that's like you don't even have to know how to spell to make that mistake. So, but um, so anyway, uh, that, anyway. So well, so I, no, if I have a strong point, it's the you know it's the shape of the letters, not quite the order they go in. <laughs> so so Mike, what is the name of your book? My book is The Unseen, and uh, it was published last year in I think March. No, it was May. I think May sixteenth. Oh, so, so good. It's been about a year and a half then. A little bit, a year and a few months. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what? That's hard to believe. Oh, I know right? it hurts my brain to think of that. It feels like it's still. It feels like I'm still. F- Getting ready to publish it. Yeah. Is, is volume two almost done? No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I write so slow. I, I, it took me, like, it's been over a year of just trying to figure it out. The, essentially, I'm using a, like, essentially the, the three by five cards on the on the cork board. Like, oh, I'm not going to start the book until that's done. <laughs> and it's getting close. Like, I got to solve everything beforehand because I made every mistake imaginable jumping into that that, that book well, I, without I, I, an outline. I, I, I genuinely love the book, but then it ends and I'm like, wait, where's part two? And I think you initially told me you weren't planning on doing a part two. And I was like, what? Uh, that has been a consistent bit of feedback I have gotten. Yes. So like it's, not, a, yeah. it's a great story, but it builds into a bigger story. And then you end. You know, let's not cloud the issue with facts. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let, yeah, I mean, let's. It's obvious that you wanted to do something like you, you told me, like the old 70s uh, Movie. novels that they don't necessarily explain everything in the plot and they sometimes leave you with a with a big cliffhanger and you don't know if the story is going to uh, continue or not. But I guess nowadays we're so spoiled as a society, we need at least... Uh, three sequels for every mo- <laughs> mo- movie. <laughs> and then it'll, it'll be made into a musical after that on Broadway. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> like seven books for every series, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm okay with sequels if the story's there. I, I, I kind of have to, I'm going to, I kind of have to keep the same mood and vibe yeah. in part two. And that has been the challenge. Like I got some great ideas and I kind of flesh them out and I think about them and I'm like, ah. Oh. It's a divergence from the from the vibe of the first one. It doesn't fit. It would fit yeah. like a mm. it would fit like a your standard action episodic television show, you know, that has espionage and spies and car chases and stuff like that. It fit perfect in that kind of story, but that it would not fit as a follow up to to the mood of the I book can, as it was written. I can definitely that understand sense. that. No, I can definitely yeah. understand that because um I think part of what makes your book The Unseen so powerful, Mike, is <clears throat> the fact that it is so oblique. Yeah. And the story goes in such a bigger direction, as Soraya alluded to. I don't really know necessarily. I'm not trying to dash your hopes here. I'm just full of uh, lovely, lovely insights tonight, I guess. But um, <laughs> but I don't know how you retain that sort of sense of wonder with where the story naturally wants to go without being like, you know, mm-hmm. just straight up talking about <laughs> craft and out of body experiences and whatnot, um, because you do such an excellent job. Something that you've you've talked about, you're very proud of is. There is never once the phrase, what is it, alien? Or no, nope. couple, couple of different or UFO. The UFO yeah. never gets mentioned. Alien, yeah. abduction, depression mm-hmm. never gets written. Yeah, I, I did it all without those words. Uh, shaman only gets mentioned twice. And basically, it was like, is that guy a shaman? And it's like, no, he's not a shaman. So that's the only time shaman gets <laughs> mentioned in the book. So. Well, you do, you do a, a very good job of like a dark night of the soul. For sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we should probably give a, a brief synopsis. Yes, yes. That, was, the book. that was the next thing I was going to say. I, yeah, so I can give it if you want. Yes, tell us about your book, Please. Mike. Hey, hey. 
Uh, it was, it is a, uh, I'm doing the, I, I, the, as an author, you're supposed to be able to answer this question. And this is, I struggle with it every time. There's a main character who is more than a little bit based on me, who has a, he's an artist. So, so here, let me back up a little bit. This book was initially meant to be a comic book, fully meant to be a comic book. I was going to draw it as a graphic novel. And it was, so the, the, the concept, the big picture concept in the book was stuff I wanted to draw. Like there's a lot of it that takes place in a desert landscape in southern Utah, and that would be totally fun to draw. The wilderness and the canyons and the mood and the and the color scheme. I had all of that worked out. And then I I contacted, of all people, Christopher Knowles, who runs The Secret Sun, because he had done a lot of comic book work. And I said, yeah, I got this project and I'm thinking about doing a graphic novel all by myself. And he was like, oh, buddy, don't do it. Don't do it. You're like, don't, you'll make yourself crazy. So I, I said, oh, well, and then I put it on the shelf. And eight years later, I picked it up again. I think it was nine years later, I picked it up again and and said, oh, there's something here to this. I'd already written three other books at that point. So I figured I could write fiction. You know, what the heck? How hard could that be? And that was, <laughs> it was much, much harder than I thought. But. Um, the story involves a guy who, who has a like a creative crisis, like a crisis of creativity and kind of disappears from society. And in doing so, kind of like drifts into a, like a little twilight zone realm and ends up in this very small town. And while, while in this town, there's this sense of mystery that's pervading the landscape and the town. And then he realizes the town is, I don't want to give too much away because there's lots of spoilers here, but he realizes the town is like the epicenter for these, this crew of spies, like these seeming like non-governmental spies that are using psychic abilities for some unknown reason. So the, what I say is the first roughly one third of the book is the internal dialogue of, of the main character. And that would be sort of the dark night of the soul. And then the second two thirds of the story is him being confronted with the strange goings on in this town. And in the so the second two thirds, he plays a detective and tries to, to solve the mystery of the town, not realizing that the mystery is himself. And I don't think I gave anything away with that synopsis. No. Also, there are owls. There are seven owls in it, which is, which is, I worked, worked, worked to keep as few owls as I, oh, man, there was a lot more owls in the initial draft. Yeah. So mm. but I, I want, I, I would like, sorry, go ahead. I once had seven owls in my tree outside. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah, seven owls, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have a picture of, of, uh, 28 owls on a fence. Wow. So, yeah. Something someone sent it to I'll... me. I didn't take it myself, but someone sent it to me. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be a, an early reader as, as Mike alluded to. And, um, I the the best compliment that I can give him is that there were several turns of phrase because I was you know I was still working on my novel at the time <laughs> synchronistically, I didn't know that, though, really. um, but there there were several turns of phrase where I was super super jealous of Mike <laughs> for, for pulling it <laughs> off because there's some very lovely things that were written in there and um, yeah it's 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 good stuff highly recommend everyone check it out. Now, if I remember right, Mike, you said that the initial draft of this book the the opening bit was a lot longer. Well, there's a point where the character walks alone in the desert and has a kind of, uh, you know, kind of a Jesus, you know, into the wilderness or like a walkabout, you know, a shamanic walkabout. Um, and it was longer. And I, I really worked to pair it back. So it wasn't a lot longer, but it, but I did my very best to to make the story as sparse as I could get away with mm. and still have it have that kind of lyrical quality to it. So, so I did, a, I was, oh, my red pen, like got a real workout in this book. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did, you did good. Um, I mean, one of the questions I had asked you is what, why uh, there's a point where they see blue light. I asked you why blue, but you didn't really have a specific reason for choosing blue. Oh, sure. I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. And I, I can tell you, well, I gotta oh, be careful. Cause right. there's some, some, there was, there was a, there, I'll, I'll be very cautious here. Cause this is kind of a, that this is, this might be a spoiler. I'll but, um, be very cautious. <laughs> there is an image in Carl Jung's The Red Book. That's right. That's right. And mm. I kind of had that that uh, image in The Red Book. And um, is it was always, I remember I saw that image and I'm like, oh, this solves everything in the book. Like now that I've got this image, with it's heavily blue. I'll mm -hmm. say a blue orb in the image. And um, and anyone who, you can search out The Red Book and you'll probably be able to find it. So um and I, and that image really sort of took over a lot of the mystique of the book. 
Yeah, and, and I've been following reports of people having experiences with the color blue and paranormal stuff, which are much more uh, common than you would think. And blue is just kind of a weird color. So when you selected blue, I'm like, why did he pick blue? So the other reason was when I wanted to do it as a comic book, all the daylight scenes in the comic book, the palette of the page, and I did some pre-production sketches on this, all the palettes of the page, were, were, it was only going to be muted tans and muted yellows mm. in the in the daylight scenes. And all the nighttime scenes were going to be black and dark blue and light blue. Mm. And that was another reason I, I, I used I was thinking of blue initially just in the inception of the comic book idea. So are you still going to make a comic book? Oh, I think it would make a great graphic novel. I think it would be transposed to a graphic novel beautifully. Um, I'm not going to do it alone. I'm just like, I just know enough about myself. I'd, Fair I'd, enough. Yeah. If I, if someone wanted to hire a team and I could manage it, oh, I think we could make a beautiful book. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say, like, if you had to simple, simplify it down, what would you say the book's about? There is a pop culture thriller, a paranormal thriller with some espionage elements, some love interest elements. That's the surface story. Below that, below the waterline, I did my very best to hide a deeper story, a story of a mythic story. And I don't want to go too much into that. And I, what I can say is I, when I did that, when I was, was trying to sneak that deeper, more mysterious story, not on the surface, it's buried in, the, in this pop, in this kind of pop culture. I don't want to say standard because it's certainly, but, but it has the elements of yeah, like a thriller. Yeah, yeah. And below that waterline, um, I hid that, and I was so nervous that no one was going to catch it, and I would just confuse people. And I was so completely heartened when the first few Amazon reviews came in, and people got it. People said right off, they were like, they caught it, they recognized it, and they they were they were complimentary to the story, and they were fully aware that 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 underlying story was was had seeped through throughout you know from the first page to the last. All right. Let's move on to Josh's book for a moment. And now, Josh, before, before we move yeah. on, uh, I wanted to uh, also compliment Mike because uh, as a fan of Carlos Castaneda's books, I noticed a lot of reference to those books that may not be, you know, easily recognizable to the average reader because, you know, Castaneda is not as popular as it were as he as he was in the 1960s yeah but if you have read uh his books then you will notice that there are a lot of references not only uh, with the landscape and also with one of the central characters uh, in the book that uh, that is pretty much like a mentor to the main character but also uh, the idea of uh, psychedelic use, you know, which is something that al almost caught me off guard because, I mean, at least in his Hidden Experience blog, it's not something that Mike uh, really explored in depth, you know, the connection between uh, psychedelic experiences and the other high strangeness experiences that he researched. Mm. I, I did go to high school in the 70s, so I don't know what the statute of limitations is on this stuff, so I'll leave it at that. So. All right. Um, so, Josh, what is the name of your book? Mine is, excuse me, my, oh, whoops, something fell. Um, <laughs> mine is uh, Them Old Ways Never Died. And uh, I, uh, I have always sort of had a, a little bit of a pull towards fiction um and also like the not just the art part but the craft part you know so i've always been interested in you know issues of pacing and of uh you know why we feel certain ways during films and whatnot um mm -hmm. i grew up in a household where my my dad subscribed to the trades like daily, daily variety and such so like I, I was always sort of interested in um the craft part of it and it was something that i didn't know if i could pull off um <laughs> arguably i didn't um but uh you know a big thing that was a motivating force for me was um, I w I've always been a fan of films that, you know, oh, it's about a monster, but the monster is clearly a, a stand in for something else. And if the metaphor of the monster can be overlain with a bigger, more insightful, um, you know, aspect of the human condition or something like that then that's what really resonates with me. And for the longest time, I didn't, <clears throat> I couldn't come up with a, a real hook for it in that regard um, until I did. And when I did, it just all came to me at once. Um, so that was part of my motivation. And part of the motivation too, was to experience this thing, which 
I've heard from so many friends of mine, so many author friends of mine who write fiction, um, even like real, you know, straight ahead um, reductionist, materialist, atheist types. They'll say things like, oh, yeah, well, the character wouldn't let me do this or that. And I'm like, wait, do you do you hear yourself? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what, like, what do you mean the character wouldn't let you do this? So I wanted to experience this sort of like quasi magical working um, that I heard happens uh, in the novel, when it, in the novel writing process. And I, I got a little bit of that, too. So if, if I remember right, when I asked Michael Marshall Smith that, he said he doesn't really, like, conversate with the characters, but he knows, like, when he's writing, the character wouldn't do this. The character wouldn't do that. You know, so it's not quite, he never, never quite made it to that point, but, like, the character, where the character was sort of speaking to him, but, like, he just he just knew, like, this this isn't that character. You know, this, this character can't do this thing I just decided he was going to do. Right. Well, it, it definitely runs the gamut. Um, you know, I didn't quite have anything that embodied, but if you look at some of the stuff that's out there <laughs> that I've been really researching lately, um, there are authors, some of which who are, you know, basically household names, Nobel laureates and, uh, you know, people that you had to read in, in high school, <laughs> um, who claimed like, no, this, this character reached out and touched me, like literally touched me. Um, I didn't have that, <laughs> but I did have um, this really annoying habit <clears throat> that uh, started forming with me, which was uh, ideas that I'd, sorry, problems rather, that I'd puzzled over all day would just come to me on the verge of sleep. And I was like, okay, well, I've got to, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I've got to get back up and write, you know, write this down <laughs> or I'm going to lose it because inevitably you do lose it. Right. Um, but it's amazing how those problems just sort of resolve themselves once you let go of them. Uh, you know, that that's true of a lot of things, not just writing. Oh, yeah, I, I joke that I do my best writing between the desk and the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what what would you say your book is about? It's an Appalachian addiction goblin trauma drama. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> no, I mean, so, yeah, that's that's the real ironic thing is they say, write what you know about. And, of course, I ended up writing about um, some <laughs> – someone who was struggling with alcoholism and is a musician in North Georgia. So I guess I didn't go too far out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, anybody who's familiar with my work um, knows that I'm going to bring up, bring up uh, fairies, aliens, or, you know, phalians, <laughs> as I've taken to calling them. Um, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's much more, it's kind of funny because it was, bo it was written at the same time that Mike was writing his book. And uh, where Mike was oblique, I was just pretty much dead on direct. <laughs> um, so it, it's kind of like an interesting contrast in that regard. Um, they do take place in a quasi shared universe with Mike's permission. So we can get around to that at some point if you want yes, to. But um, yeah. I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, there's so many things I wanted to do. So number one, I, I've always been a big fan of like, you know, 80s fantasy, you know, Labyrinth is a favorite of mine, but I, mm. I've always been wondering, you know, there are these fairy movies that come out, right? And they always play fast and loose with the with the folklore. Um, it's good up until a certain point, and then they'll just like, you know, throw something out completely at random. I mean, there was a, a film recently that was pretty good, but it, it, it's centered around red caps in Ireland, and red caps aren't in Ireland. <laughs> was so, that was that unwanted? Um, uh, um, yeah, that was that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I love the I loved some of those practical effects. I loved a lot of the things that they did incorporate. But it was like, ah, I just can can you just what what would happen if you were really like faithful to what these things seem to be, and also the things that you add or change or use to use to serve the story are things that are speculative, like you know the appearance of theories in Appalachia, which is something that, you know, there isn't a lot of data on, but there's uh, implications of, of a migration there. So I, I was, um, I was wondering yeah. what you would think of that movie. Cause I watched it and I was, I was not particularly blown away by it, um, but it was okay. And I'm kind of like, I wonder what Josh would think of this. It was okay. You know, it's, I, I it was, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard for me because I, I compare so much fairy fiction now to uh, King of Morning, Queen of Day which is just an absolutely it's, it's the best piece of fairy fiction I've ever read. Um, <clears throat> so that was part of the driving force. Um, part of it too was, um, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough during the pandemic to have something to turn to besides live music. Um, and a lot of my friends who you know made most of their living on live music and, or derive the, their meaning in life from live music. They didn't really have a chance to, um, it, it really hit them in hard in a hard way. And I kind of wanted to encase that moment in Amber. So that's in the book a little bit too. Um, but, uh, those were sort of the, the main driving forces. And then once I saw that, oh, you can kind of look at maybe, maybe, in, maybe a generational fairy thing is kind of a metaphor for addiction. Um, that kind of all sort of fell in my lap. So I, 
I remember distinctly um, April of, uh, gosh, I guess this was 20, April of 2022, um, you know, driving down to Florida and, you know, having to tell my wife to write down these cryptic phrases because these ideas kept on pouring in. Um, but it does take place over a span of, I think, about 150 years, um, all told, uh, telling stories of different generations dealing with this thing and the eventual resolution of those problems. Hmm. Um, I was going to ask you something and I lost it. Um, Red Bill, you have read it. What, what do you want to ask Josh? Oh, hi. why will I ask Josh that I haven't already? Uh, <laughs> because I did a, a last year, I did an interview with him for the Daily Grail YouTube channel. I mean, I mean, I guess one year later, what you think are is the response from 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 the public, you know, the reviews, and is it what you wanted? And you, did people get it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I had the chance to meet up with Morgan Daimler at an event recently um, that was here in Atlanta, and, and Morgan and I were talking about uh, just the what to expect when a fictional book comes out, and it's it's just such a different market. Um, you know, I know that Morgan goes through the similar experiences as well, where you know Morgan's work is on fairies is fantastic and it's popular, but the fictional stuff doesn't sell as well. So I think that you sort of set yourself up in a market. Um, for one thing. And people were like, huh, like, what are you doing now? <laughs> so, uh, there, there have been, I've gotten some, some, some quizzical, uh, reactions for the most part, but, um, of the people who have read it and have reached out to me, um, they seem to, they seem to really resonate with a lot of the things that I put in there. They seemed to know when to read between the lines, which was mm. uh, really important for me. But, you know, I was, I was emailing back and forth with Mike a little bit, uh, before we got on here earlier this week. And, uh, I, I mentioned to him, I mean, you know, I, I did it for myself. Like I, you know, I, um, what is it? I used to, I, I say that I had, I always had high aspirations for the project, but you know, tempered expectations for it, you know? So mm. again, I, I wrote it for me. Those characters live with me. They live in my head. They exist in some form or fashion. Um, and so that really is all that I expected it to be. So, um, but you know, I, I, having said that there's some mutual friends of ours and friends of the show and friends that we know through some of our other communities that have, uh, really said some, some, some good, some kind things to me. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love it. I love it. It's, it's a bit like, it's probably going to fall into the same category as the brimstone deceit, which is like a book that I love, but people are kind of lukewarm on, but yeah, mm. I, I love the brimstone stone deceit. Well, thank you. It's my worst selling book. <laughs> I, I know it is. And it's, and it sucks because there's so much revelatory stuff in that book. Yeah. I've had some experiences where, you know, I'll, I'll be online and someone will be like, Oh, I wonder if Bigfoot has scent glands. I wonder what the different smells mean. Huh? Moving on. And I'm like, people, I did this for you. You know, I did this so you could, so you, could you know, you know, so you can take this side, these ideas and this research and move it forward. But, you know, um, again, but it, it, it is sort of like brimstone in the way that like the people who know it seem to really like it. It's just that it does fall into that category of like, I don't know if that's exactly what I'm looking for from Josh. So I can't, but yeah, I can't complain. And, I'm, I'm just, again, I'm really grateful that it exists at all. And I mean, that's, that's the same issue that Graham Hancock came up against. You know, he wrote what, <laughs> how many, like six fiction books and yeah, a ton of them. And people were just like, but we want nonfiction. We, we want your other <laughs> yep. stuff, you know? And he was like, yep. you can at least give it a try. you know." Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, they were just, the, the other thing that I really am glad that I got to do and probably wasn't, isn't, wasn't great for the book overall was that, you know, I just, I really luxuriated in some purple prose here and there um, mm. because I just don't, you know, I, as we were talking about before we started, like when I write my nonfiction books, I'm obsessed with word count. Like I don't want it to be too long or else you wind up with ecology of souls. Right. So, so, you know, I, in this one, I was like, you know what? I never get to just describe the leaves of the trees. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Sit yourself down. I'm going to describe these leaves. And I, that's not for everyone. Um, there are a lot of writing teachers who will tell you not to do that. But I was like, you know what? This is this project's for me, so I'm going to do it. Well, it's interesting because Mike does that with the uh, the painting in The Unseen. Like you go into great right. detail about how this artist paints and why he does it certain ways and why he doesn't do it certain ways and, and little little subtleties about it. Mike. Wow, I actually yeah. painted paintings for an artist in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. His name is uh, Billy Shank. And uh, so uh, that it's based on his works, the, those the paintings in the, in the story. 
Mm. He would sit. He would sit on the phone, and I would paint his paintings for him. Really? That's a little. It, it, that sounds bad. It wasn't quite as bad as it sounds. But <laughs> you know, there's other artists who have had studio assistants, and I was one of. I was a studio assistant for him. But it was the only time I've ever worked in oil paints, and I liked his stuff a lot. His stuff was really beautiful. So, so how does that work? Like he just describes it to you? No, he. So he. It's very, very, very. You know, formalized. He he takes a special pen, and he like. St- and he's working mostly from photographs. So he projects, this is ancient history. There's this thing called slides. He had a slide projector, the <laughs> physical slide that he would put in the projector. This is in the early 1990s. And uh, he would project it onto a giant canvas, huge canvas. And then he would draw with a pen and he had this special pen that didn't like, wouldn't bleed through the ink. And, and then he would go with this palette and he would mix up all the colors. I'm colorblind. So Oh, really? And he would mix up the colors and he would number them and he would say, oh, it basically a giant paint by number. And then he huh. would go back in the very end and clean up little things. But, but, but it was his work for sure. And, uh, and it was really, uh, anyway, it was, so I, and I was the only time I ever worked in oil paints and the guy was totally fun to hang out with during the day. And there was another woman that I worked with her. Her name was Betsy. And we would sit around and, and paint these things in this fabulous old cabin in Jackson hole. So I had no idea that this was a thing, nor that you had done that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So that's funny. If you don't want me to party, cause I'll start telling you things that I've done in my life and people are like, what you did? What? So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, someone else here needs to write an autobiography, Mike. I did write. It's my worst selling book, my memoir. Yeah. So <laughs> wait, you did this. <laughs> I, yeah, I did it. Yeah. So I think it sells a little bit. Of, I think the only book that sells it's selling worse than the brimstone deceit. When, 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 <laughs> when did you put this out? I'd never even heard of I it. I put this out in 2019. It's called hidden experience. It's a memoir. Oh. You might, I mean, it's, it's most of the, most of it is about my coming to terms with my UFO contact stuff, but I, I didn't right, put everything right. in there, but, so, but I did make, I did write a memoir. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, I have but, that. I was yeah. I was thinking more of a full autobiography of all the interesting uh, stuff you've done. I've worn the Kool Aid costume. <laughs> <laughs> did you break through a wall? Ah, I, I did not this. break through a wall. I did not break through a wall. But I did say, "Oh yeah," really loud when I <laughs> I'm dating myself. This is anyone like under forty or fifty won't know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> yeah, they will. Everyone knows the Kool Aid Man. Okay, I, it was the real costume I ride the road. You know, so. Was it a job, or is it just I want to wear the Kool Aid Man I, costume? No, I was. At a, I was working at. A, I was in New York City, and I was doing pre-production work for TV commercials, and it was, and I was on the set in this one, so I was actually doing production work on a TV commercial. And this was actually this, this was the studio that did uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Excuse me, oh. Pee Wee's Playhouse. Oh, so okay, it was Pee Wee props all over the place, and I didn't. I never worked on that show, but. Uh, and then we like it was late, late, late at night, and I'm in my twenties, and you know you'd kind of drink beer and that time of night and stuff like that. And we walk to the other studio, and there's the there's the Kool Aid costume, and there's nobody around. And I'm like, well, I'm putting this thing on. So I was too tall for it. Whoever actually wears it is is shorter than I am. So. And you couldn't sense. even like just pull out your phone and take a picture at the time. I couldn't idea that was that, that was that was another twenty years in the future yeah. to be able you to. Gotta, do you got to have a low center of gravity to wear the the, the Kool Aid costume. Yeah. I imagine my shoulders. Didn't quite, <laughs> yeah, my elbows. The, my, my arms were too long. The, like the little the little front, the, the fabric arms that I put my hand through. So. You know, you know the thing about think about that. Like you, it's so easy to just take pictures and videos of everything now, and you're not wasting film. You're not, you know, it's, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and there's so much stuff in my life I wish I had that for, but I'm sure there's also things I'm glad are not on film. Oh my word, I'm glad that there's <laughs> stuff. That, I'm so glad that there's that no one had a camera during during certain chapters of my life. So, <laughs> but anyway, back, we should talk about art and books. Well, interestingly enough, the, the art is kind of the connective thread between. Uh, uh, them Both always never died in the yeah. unseen. Yeah, there's some. Um, I, I was at one point there was a picture, a painting in in my book, and I had just finished reading Mike's novel, and I said, "Hey, Mike, can I can I make this one of your protagonist's paintings?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yes, but describe it in this way," and I, and I and I did. Um, and so it's I don't know how these two universes would necessarily play together because again, Mike is so artistic and oblique about what's happening, and I'm a, so much more direct, but um. I like to think that they that they take place in the same reality. So, oh okay. yeah, very much so, very much so. So that so my book was takes place in two thousand nine, and I did that purposely so so not everyone had a smartphone and just the, mm. and, it, and it also kind of there's plot points that require like a, the the sort of real estate collapse in, uh, yeah. in two thousand nine. So mm-hmm. um, so yeah, so there's a there's like a twenty year. Well, excuse me, eleven year head start on your on your story. Yeah, when does what when does yours take place, Josh? Well, it it, it 
the pandemic is is a big part of it, so it okay. takes place in 2020. But again, it's like technically the story starts in like 18, I think 57 or something. 1897. Like that. 1897. Yeah. August thank 2nd. you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. August 2nd. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> August um, 1897, and then there are some flashbacks that are sprinkled throughout that sort of reveal exactly the nature of what's going on as you go through. But the bulk of the action takes place in 2020. Okay. And now, who who did the cover art for what? I did the cover art for my book. Okay. Right. And then I know who did the cover art for Joshua's book too. Who's that? Do? <laughs> I, I think he's here. Oh, Jeez. I, I am a good artist. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, I'm not. not. Not even slightly. Unlike Miguel. Yeah, I was uh, uh, honored enough to do the cover for that book. It was, it was not an easy endeavor because uh, I always uh, strive to read a uh, part of the, of the book to get a flavor of it. And I realized, wow, well, my God, this book is about so many things and there's so many approaches one could take uh, to try to convey the, 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 what the book's about without actually giving it, giving it too much away. So I actually created several proposals for Josh uh, and some of the, I, I think the first idea that Josh had I tried to create that and it immediately was evident that it wasn't going to work because you remember, Josh, you wanted me to do the scene, one of the scenes that happens in a, in a bathroom. Yes. Yes. You I remember very that. Very <laughs> specific about it. Yeah. So specific that I actually went and created a 3D model of that room, you know, <laughs> because in another life I used to do that for a living, you know, go use AutoCAD to create uh, that's, 3D that's, models. That's so right. I, actually, I, I had done a little mock-up of a blue of a blueprint of the house to show you. Well, for yeah, my purposes, right. but I shared that with you too. Yeah, for my purposes that's for right. writing, that's I shared that, that with you. Yeah, it did not work. It's like, yeah. why are we looking at a toilet? <laughs> exactly. Like, okay, this is such a great idea, and you are giving uh, <laughs> the idea of a toilet. Uh, that said, Mike, you know, I love what you did with your own uh, cover, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I remember thinking, why isn't there any kind of hint in the cover that uh, the story has uh, supernatural undertones? It does have it. It's right on the cover. It says a paranormal thriller right in the corner. Yeah, but only as a text. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, maybe you could add some symbolism in the in the in the drawing itself. Yeah, that's why I, I, I did. I, mean, I put the little banner in the corner because that was like uh, the books in the 60s and 70s, very, like less so in the 70s, but in the 60s and early ah. 70s, the, like a really low grade, like pulpy, trashy novel would have a little banner in the corner, and I like, like Bantam Thriller or, you know, Romance or something like that. So. Okay, that's so. Fair. So I put it in there. I put the. Thr- I, it says paranormal thriller, and it's got a picture of a skull right there. So yeah, well, I, I want us to see like the, the the shadow of an owl, you know, above the guy. Oh, <laughs> I got so- this. Yeah, I got enough books with owls in the cover. Yeah, so I don't need to- <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It it it, it becomes something of a you know another one. And and the, and to be, to, to be clear, owls are not like a major part of the story. You've written. they're kind mm-hmm. of just on the the edges. Uh, that was on purpose too. Yeah, yeah. So despite and, you being the owl guy, well, the sit the thing is like you know people say, hey Mike, you're gonna write another book, and I'm like, I wrote three books on owls and and the paranormal, and I was like, if you stack, the, I've given this little speech a bunch of times, but if you take those three books on owls and the paranormal that I wrote back to back to back, about two years in between each one. And you stack those up; it's almost exactly one thousand pages on owls and UFOs. And and people say, "Hey, you gonna write another book?" And I'm like, "Well, like, I'm like, no." I'm like, if I can't say it in a thousand pages, it's not gonna do anyone any good to write another book. <laughs> like, you know. Uh, so so that was the, the so I could explore these ideas in fiction in a different way than I could explore them in nonfiction. And that was kind of the the it, I was I was struggling to. Here, let me back up a little bit. Because of the work I do and because I ask people to send me their owl stories, boy, do I get them. I get them. And I apologize to the people who may have sent me some stories because I am trying my very best to reply to everyone. I simply cannot. I am flooded with these stories. And what I can say is that these stories, often involving an owl and a UFO together, not all the stories have that, but a lot of them do, they have this mood to them, this palpable elusive flavor. Mm-hmm. And that was what I wanted to try to capture in the story. I, 
I, w- I didn't, I, I, I wanted to capture that mood. And so many of the accounts that, that show up in the fiction book are taken, lifted directly from either, you know, this is an odd thing to say, but f- in a small part, they were lifted from um, the stories I have received or stories I've heard. And what I can say is perhaps to a larger degree, they are taken from my own life experience. Mm. In, in, so I was trying to capture that, that sense of awe, that sense of mystery, that, that when, when, when one is confronted with one of these accounts, one of these strange owl stories, you have to, you know, that you're, you're left off balance. And I, that's what I was trying to mm. capture. I mean, one of the things that I appreciated in both books uh, as a fellow artist is how you both were so uh, able to portray the struggle of the artist with coping with addictions, you know, two different addictions in in, in the case of Joshua, well, uh, it was uh, straight up alcohol, alcoholism in the unseen. Well, it, it's that, but it's their sense of a uh, you know, that the character is struggling with a sense of being dissatisfied, even though he apparently has managed to, you know, fulfill his desire of becoming a a success, you know, like he's made it and he's still, you know, miserable. And I I really appreciated that because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we have discussed this uh, plenty of times in this, in this uh, podcast, how, there seems to be a connection between people who have creative, a creative uh, streak, you know, who have these uh, creative inclinations, and that they are capable of perceiving uh, or interacting with the phenomenon in ways that people who are more, shall we say, left brain are incapable of. You know, I mean, and nowadays, once again, in the UFO field, we have so many people that are obsessed with trying to like put UFOs on some kind of like scientific chart and trying to deconstruct the phenomenon because they want to uh, decipher the physics of it, you know, try to find out what makes UFOs tick, right? trying to find out the proposal system and all that, but that simply doesn't work. And, and I think that there are people with a creative streak who are aware of that, but at the same time, that awareness comes with a price, a price of being left out with even with a certain trauma. And in the both books, the characters are dealing with trauma, even even if they're not aware of it. And and the way that they cope with that trauma is aside from their you know creative passions, they also cope with it with uh, their addictions. You know, and I think that that is something that uh, isn't discussed that often within the paranormal realm. You know, there's obviously swept under the rock, as it were, because it's kind of like uh, the skeletons we try to keep hidden. But, you know, I, for one, appreciate that your candor in saying, well, no, you know, this is something that, you know, that happens. People, people are struggling with with uh, certain issues and and. Maybe it's part of being, you know, in some type of relationship with the phenomenon, you know, like it's, it's, it's the price that, that people pay. I think that is a, a huge, I mean, it's, it's getting more attention than it has in the past, but I think that is a, is a huge part of this. Um, and, uh, there's something about, you know, there's, there are those stats about, oh, you know, do experiencers have more incidents of child abuse or right. this sort of trauma or that sort of trauma? And the answer is yes, I think so, but I don't think it's necess- that that is necessarily I don't think any of these things necessarily are a requisite for contact, right? So right. I think that like certain things make you more contact prone and it can be some sort of di- I think it's I personally think that it's dissociation be it through illness or trauma or trance or, you know, entheogen use or any number of things, but also I think that this thing can sort of reach down and 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 uh, reach down and touch you too. But if you're looking at somebody who has this sort of longitudinal contact, I think that trauma is a is is indeed a big part of it. Yeah, which has always interested me. Like, why trauma? And I mean, the association thing is very possible. Um, having dealt with a lot of people who have experienced severe trauma, as well as a lot of paranormal stuff, I mean, I feel like that. I mean, there's an obvious connection there. Kenneth Ring called it the encounter-prone personality, uh, and trauma right. trauma was a part of that. But mm-hmm. I've also, you know, like myself. 
with all the weird stuff that's happened to me, I've never had any serious drama in my life. Um, the same, and I was thinking the same with Jeff Ritzman. I never talk, heard Jeff talk about any serious trauma. I mean, I don't know if I ever specifically asked him, but in all the paratopias I've listened to now, I don't, he's never, you know, in all the times I talked to him, he never mentioned anything really all, all that traumatic from growing up. So I don't know if he had that either. Well, that's, you know, from, and this is just me speaking from my own personal experience. So no one necessarily take this as the gospel truth, but one of the things that I had hammered in my home, in my head, um, during the recovery period was that like a lot of people do have trauma and don't necessarily recognize it as such. And it doesn't mm. necessarily always have to scale the same way. Sure. <laughs> um, so that could be part of what you're seeing, you know, as far as with any of these topics, we're dealing with self-reporting too, you know, so pe- some people, they might not recognize it. They might not remember it, or they might just not want to share it. And that's fine too. That's also true. Um, but you know, but, but you know, I'm not saying that, but again, I think that sometimes you can be like, you know, just this person who, has had a relatively um, straightforward life. And for whatever reason, this thing can also reach down in those moments as well. And, and I've gone to therapists and sort of describe. So, so my story deals with depression. I have been very open on my blog and my writing and all my books. I haven't shied away from the, the depression aspect of my life. And it, it's kind of made me the person I am in many ways, which, yeah. which I'll say has made me more sensitive and a better listener and than I would have been without it, I think. Um, so, um, but you know the I I knew Jeff Ritzman a little bit and you know and I but I certainly know his story and as far as trauma when you're talking about someone who's had the contact experience whether that's abduction or whatever vocabulary word you want to use the implication is that there could be unremembered trauma in because these contact experiences are often hidden through a form of like amnesia that seems to be created by the UFO occupants. And I'm using, I mean, there's a lot of phrases in there that yeah. you could use any number of terms, but the, the, there could be buried trauma that is simply not that the, that the individual cannot access. And I have gone through my own musings, my own wondering if that could have been at play in my life. I do not have an answer, um, mm. but I, but I don't discount that as a possibility. At the same time, I don't want to live my life as a as a victim. Right. Sure. Right. I mean, it's it's maybe it's the trauma comes from not from the phenomenon itself or from interacting with the phenomenon, but maybe interacting with the rest of society. You know what I mean? Like I know. Yes. 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 Think of the movie like they live. Uh, think of people like you know experiencers. They are more sensitive than the rest of us. It's like they are wearing those special sunglasses all the time, and they are able to see the hidden messages that the rest of the world is totally oblivious to. And trying to convey that to the rest of people, say, can't you see that? Can't you see that the guy at the bank counter is a monster, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a bug out alien and people not believing that maybe that is the root of the trauma. You know? mm, interesting way of looking at it. And I know Jeff's experiences started when he was a young child. Uh, as did mine. Yeah. Yeah, whereas mine didn't start until I hit puberty. As far as I know, I don't remember much from my, oh, young, I, yeah, you know, yeah. But any trauma I had was was more likely, uh, I mean, the stuff that I'm still dealing with is is from when I was a teenager after all this stuff started and had nothing to do with this stuff directly. Uh, it was mostly my dad, honestly, just being, a, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what he would have been diagnosed as. Uh, definitely bipolar, um, mm. but he was, you know, not in a generation where they, they did that stuff. You know, he was an alcoholic. Yeah. He was bipolar. There was right. probably some other stuff going on. So you never knew what you were getting with him. He he could be the nicest guy in the world, or he could be the biggest a-hole for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. 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 So that, that stuff comes up still to me in dreams. So I'm like, okay, clearly I haven't dealt with this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it doesn't really play a part in my experiences either, you know, because they were already happening before he got really bad with that stuff. Right. And that's one of the problems that I've run into trying to sort of chase this thread is that you run into this recurring, I call it the chicken and the egg problem (laughs) is because, you know, you'll hear, you you know, I mean, it would be so tidy to just say, oh, well, look, UFO experiencers have near death experiences as well. Look at that. Well, the near death experience must have come first. And it's like, well, (laughs) not always. Sometimes Mm -hmm. that's the case. Sometimes it's not. Um, Then you also run into this fuzzy territory, you know, of 
the contact experience itself being a sort of self-fulfilling trauma, you know? Um, True. So I, I mean, no th- idea. That was, that was the thing that, that broke me with, with Kenneth Ring's book is not so much that he was showing that people had both, you, you know, UFO and, and your death experiences, but showing the similarities between them. And at the time, I was still on the nuts and bolts UFO thing. So I'm like, well, what do aliens have to do with dying? Oh, and, so, and, that, and that's where my yeah. brain had to go, <laughs> okay, maybe maybe that's not what's going on here. Maybe th- maybe this is not what happens what we die, when we die. Maybe this aren't, these aren't aliens, you know? Right. And that's, um, that's, that, that was the thing that made me start just questioning everything. Mm, it's, 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 there's, do you know, are you familiar with Michael Newton, the Dr. Michael Newton who did the life between lives? Oh uh, yes. Yes. Sort of a reworking of like a, of a reincarnation type experience, but between lives, right. You sort mm-hmm. of live out one life, you die and then you kind of meet with your counsel, you know, where you're, yeah. you know, and you kind of say, well, you, here's what worked your last life. Here's what we're going to try to do your next life. And, and then you add the UFO mix to that, you know, and it, the implication is, and I just reread uh, Passport to the Cosmos, and it's all, it's in there, like just the, you know, basically in between lives, you know, people are dealing with their guides, which mm. are seemingly aliens, not necessarily from another planet, but the, but they they have invaded that nether world between lives, between yeah. two reincarnated lives, and and then you step into this world, so it's. So you add that to the mix and it's like, well, you know, if you chose it before you were even born, you know, like with a, with a benevolent counsel of your, of your closest soulmates, you know, and then that, what does it all mean? And you know? that gels very well with the Seth material as well. Exactly. Um, Mike, one of the things I do when I ask you about the book, I mean, obviously the main character resembles you. He has all his hair, the main character. That's what, <laughs> <laughs> I did make that a point. So. Um, the the female character in the book was this based on somebody you knew or is this an invention? Ooh, I'm going to plead the fifth um... here. I'm going <laughs> to plead the fifth here. So um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I can say nothing at all on that. Um, what I can, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Um, so by not saying anything, you've kind of answered the question. <laughs> yes. Isn't that interesting? We can talk about the cover more and the little banner in the corner that says Paranormal <laughs> Thriller if you want. Um, You're not anything out of me on that one. So Okay. All right. That's fair. So, so I, I, I'll, we, all, we can talk privately about this, but I, this the, the public forum on, a, <laughs> on the internet might not be the place for it. But I can say that it is absolutely fictionalized. Absolutely well, yeah, fictionalized. Yeah. 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 I can say that there was a there was a uh, red haired girl in my neighborhood that I would walk to school with. And that's that's the end. The end of it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what about audiobooks for you guys? Oh I, my audiobook's out. I had a wonderful okay. I had a, a voice actor named Jay Myers read the thing. I paid him. I tried to read it myself. Ooh, oh, I did that. Was that a struggle? I was I spent months. I got nowhere. I mean mm. nowhere. And, and then I hired this guy and he did it in a couple of weeks and he did a beautiful job. And, and I had a chance to talk with him beforehand. And, and it was funny because I, so I, I searched out, I searched and searched and searched. And I found this guy who had a really gentle, humane voice, really had a lot of humanity. And it kind of reminded me of, well, I, I wanted it to sound like my voice to a degree. And so I contacted him. I said, can I talk with you? And he's like, well, yeah, I guess. And he kind of said, yeah, you know, usually it's the publisher that does all this. I never talk with the, with the author, really? or like pretty much never talk with the author. And I'm like, really? I would think the author would want to talk with you. And it's like, well, the, in this business, they kind of want to keep the two separate. So we really had it out. We had long conversations where I described the mood and I gave him the voices. Like, uh, those, so like... For instance, Tony in the in the book is based on Mac Tony's. Mm-hmm. So okay. I sent him a bunch of clips of Mac Tony's talking. He didn't capture it exactly, but it was close. And and so there was a few things like that. Yeah. And um, so I was so happy with the way that turned out. His his reading of it. Okay. And Josh, my audiobook is currently in production. It is being read by uh, Micah Hanks. <laughs> no, what? No, no, no. <laughs> Noted ufologist Micah Hanks. Um, well, who recommended him for the job? I, I, you know, I was it. Was it you? It was me. It was me. It yeah. was you. Okay. Well, it, well it's a it's a, it's a perfect fit. You know, Micah being from uh, Appalachia himself, um, he can capture and a guitar some, player. Yeah, and a guitar player. Yeah, so he, mm-hmm. he can capture some of that flavor, um, and also kind of appropriate because there is a character uh, in the book. Um, 
probably my favorite character, but I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to like him, if that makes but, any sense. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> uh, but uh, my favorite character is kind of like the uh, the dark, the the shadow self, Micah Hanks' shadow self. So it seems like very appropriate to, to have him included in the project. And, and, and Micah was very important to this show, too. Um, because... Oh, and, and Micah, you know, was the, per- the, the first podcast I was ever yeah. on. And I heard yeah, it. I was, it was yeah. like, I need to talk to this guy. <laughs> yep, it was it was um my birthday and I think it was twenty fourteen and I just started working on a Trojan feast and I had reached out to him just out of the blue and uh and I was on I was on the Graylian report before I'd even published anything. And we all part. are here six degrees of Micah Hanks. No, it's less yeah. than, it's less than that because the first thing I heard about Red Pill Junkie was uh, you know, when he would quote things you said in the chat room. So I knew of you from that. And uh mm. Mike, I heard Mike on the Graylian report and went, I need to talk to this guy and that's I, how- I have been in the bunker <laughs> <laughs> so i mean like literally all three of you i know of because you were on the grelian report and micah was on this show a lot in the beginning because i had him on once i'd heard him on coast to coast i didn't know who he was and it just said ufologist micah hanks so i'm like all right let me check this out and i was like oh i like this guy you know like i like his approach i like he, he's really good you know and so i had him on the show and then i was like People kept asking for more shows, and I was like, I could probably talk to Micah more, you know, <laughs> since, he, since he has sort of a vast well of knowledge. He, he's very, t- you know, obviously he can talk a lot. And so <laughs> those those were the first regular shows. I would do one with him, and I would do one with Paul Kimball. And uh, eventually those are what became the roundtable shows. But I don't think right. Paul or Micah were ever on a roundtable show. Because the first roundtable show Josh was on, and the second one uh, Red Pill was on with Josh. Yeah, and Michael and Hughes. Yeah. And that's that's coming up on 10 years now too. Jeez. Yep. <laughs> and then when I when I finally talked to Mike and I talked to Aaron Gullius around the same time and then I was like you t- you two need to be on a show together. Baldman from Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome that's- to the Baldman from Michigan podcast. <laughs> And that that's become the eighty two part UFO history show. So that that I don't think I I don't think anybody that's really involved in that, Mike, you know, Aaron, you, Soraya, I don't think any of you fully grasp what a great service to the community that series has been. Um, you know, people will ask me about you know getting up to speed on on UFO history, and I have a couple of book recommendations, like a lot of people do, but. Yeah. The thing that they really should do is just go through that, <laughs> that uh, beat by beat, <laughs> decade by, was it decade by decade or year by year? Well, decade by, yeah. it was um, supposed to be yeah. one show. I don't know why I thought that was going to happen. <laughs> and I think we got to like the 1950s and it's like, okay, so we've well run out of time now. So it wasn't really decade by decade. It was just however much we could fit in the show. And now it's year by year. Yeah. It's, it's, but it is like, it is a long form masterpiece. So. Kudos to you for that. Oh, oh well, y'all. Thanks, thanks, yeah. hey, thanks. And and that my the, it's a joy for me because because uh, Aaron Gullius is a great talker, a great orator. So I can just sit and listen and let him go, go, go. So well, you both are. You you both tell interesting stories and have a completely different approach to the subject, which is what makes that so valuable. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right, quick mid show break with some contact info and uh, a recommendation. Uh, so contact info is where the road go.com. Everything can be found there or should be able to be found there. And uh, John Tutor has just redesigned the entire page and it works amazingly well. So there's some really awesome stuff there. You can search out old shows. Every show right back to the very first one is there. If you find any issues, let me know because uh, we're still working out some of the kinks of the new, uh, the new site. But uh, it seems to be working as far as anyone can tell. So go go check it out. There's links to all our social media and a link to become a Patreon or just uh, make a donation. And uh, if you become a Patreon, it's only $3 a month. And you get these shows a week early. You get them commercial free. You get them uh, extra content pretty much with every single show and a bunch of bonus stuff. And you can see the documentary that Chris Ernst uh, filmed about Where Did the Road Go. That's available on there as well. So a ton of stuff for only $3 a month, and it helps us out greatly, as does uh, reviews and uh, good ratings on whatever you're listening to us on. And, of course, sharing the show with anyone you think might like it. All right. Um, also, if you like heavy music, I do The Last Exit for the Lost, and you can find that at thelastexit.org. 
There's a bunch of shows archived on there, and that's also a weekly six-and-a-half-hour music show with movie reviews and all kinds of other stuff mixed in and uh, a lot of exclusive stuff you're not going to hear anywhere else. It's not just a bunch of mainstream metal or anything like that. It's a very unusual and unique show. All right, as far as recommendations, I'm going with um, something I've sort of recommended before. It's a podcast called Limelight, and it's by the BBC, and they keep uh, they put out different stories is the thing, and I don't always like all the stories, but um, the one they are doing now is, uh, I think it's called 11 Minutes Dead is the most recent one, which deals with near-death experiences, and that one was pretty good. It was only five half-hour episodes, so it's not a real investment, you know, deep investment as far as listening to them. Um, I enjoyed that, and I had skipped the one before it. I don't know why. It didn't catch me right off the bat. But now that I'm listening to it, I'm in about halfway through the final episode, and it's called The Skies Are Watching. And again, if you want to find it, you have to subscribe to Limelight, and these are different stories within that. And these are the most recent two as of uh, when I'm recording this, which is the end of August 2024. Um, And the funny thing is that also The Skies Are Watching has voice acting from Jake the Snake Roberts. So that was kind of a neat treat. Treat. I did not realize that was him when I heard him. And um, yeah, at the very end, it's like they, they mentioned the character name voiced by Jake the Snake Roberts. And I'm like, really? Huh, I didn't know he did voice acting. Um, yeah, uh, if you look on the music site as well, there's a bunch of YouTube interviews and stuff, including one with Jake the Snake Roberts, because uh, we do do wrestling interviews and stuff. Uh, on that site and connected to the last exit as well. All right. So that's my recommendation. Check out the Limelight podcast from the BBC. Should be available whatever, with whatever podcatcher you're using. I'm using Podcast Addict and it's there. So uh, there you go. Now back to the show. So I'm here with Mike Cleland, Red Pill Junkie, and Joshua Cutchin, and two of which have written fiction books. Miguel, have you ever written a fiction book? No. Okay. No. Me either. I'm going to keep feeding Miguel my ideas that I don't want to do until he writes a book. That's my plan. <laughs> I, I, could, I, I, I don't think I could. I'm not sure I could write it. I could write short stories, but I don't know that I could do what you two did and write yeah. a, a, a story with that level of detail and consistency. Um, you know, I can do it in movie form. I can do it in short story form, but I've thought about it and I'm like, I don't, I don't think I could write a novel. Like I'm having a hard enough time with my own autobiography. It's, it's a weird thing, you know, because I, I don't know, Mike, if you can speak to this, but for me, it was, it was simultaneously harder and easier than my nonfiction stuff because, you know, the, the nonfiction stuff I end up citing and I've got to make sure I get things accurately and all this stuff. But there's kind of a uh, there there is a well-defined path by the time I start writing. And and there was for this, too. I'm a planner, not a pantser, to use those two different terms in the in the novelist community. But at the same time, you know, sometimes I would just be staring at that cursor that's blinking on the screen and be like, OK, where does where does how does this start? You know, how does this start? <laughs> I mean, and I'm not, and that's the thing. I'm not a good planner. I, I'm very much a uh, go with whatever's going on. So, I mean, when I wrote the script for the the uh, Gateways to Magonia, which turned out to be a completely different movie than I originally wrote, I think I wrote all that in one night. I was just inspired and just slammed it all out. I did the same thing with the 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 comedy horror movie we did, the Necro Zombies movie. Like I just zapped right through it, and I'm like, okay, it's out of my head. I I don't know where that came from, but there it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, I it, I don't think I could plan out enough of a novel, you know, was, like it's oh, it's, it's yeah, what yeah. was your experience with with that whole? Well, I had uh, written nonfiction before, just like you, and I found it simultaneously harder and so much harder. So those two <laughs> things, yeah, it was like it blew my mind Fair how enough. much harder it was, and and you know, I had I had plenty of source material for the I had been blogging about owls and UFOs for a long time so I had a ton I had a huge grab bag of stuff to use and people to call and emails to to transcribe that that's that was hard but wow it wasn't as hard as fiction and uh I think it was uh I don't think he wrote invented this but um Jim Mars wrote a fiction book really? and he said yeah that I think it's called the Sisterhood of the Rose hmm. kind of a World War II espionage uh and I have it. I have this. As I, I haven't read it. I have it on the bookshelf. Um, but it was about um, a Catholic n- convent during World War II, and there was all kinds of occult things taking place there. So, 
Oh, um, interesting. And, but, uh, but Jim Mars said, you know, the difficulty with writing fiction is fiction has to make sense. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mark, yeah. Mark Twain said that too, I think. Oh, that's maybe where, that's maybe where he stole it from. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so it was, yeah, it was, it was, um, and I found what hap- was happening with me was that I, this is like, I fell in love with the characters. Like I had, I was so emotionally connected with mm. the two, well, the th- with, with, with the three main characters of the story. Well, then there's the four. Yeah. So I was like really, really emotionally invested. Like in, in, I hope it shows in the book in a way where oh, I yes, did not sure. want to, I did not want like a, like there's like, it's in in like thriller fiction, especially in movies. There's like kind of this one upmanship. Like, oh yeah, there was a bad guy in this movie last year. I'm gonna make this guy even worse. He's gonna be even more bad and even more evil. Mm. I did not want. I did not want anyone holding that book to have to deal with that kind of darkness. I wanted it. I wanted every character to be sympathetic and likable, and I wanted you to be rooting for everyone, even the bad guys. Well, I wanted you to be rooting and, for. And that's like real life. We I want mean, that. The, the, we just want that out of just politeness, out of our, or I do anyway. Just yeah, I want to surround myself with that kind of vibe. Yeah. But what I'm I saying, mean, what I'm saying though, is that like in real life, first of all, no one thinks they're the villain, and right. second, you know, it's like there, there's different sides to every person. No one is a single thing. So when mm-hmm. you have those movies where the guy's just a, an evil villain, it's like yeah, this type of person rarely exists. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's the James Bond villain has to be charming in a way. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah and even in the books, uh, one thing that I appreciated was uh, that the paranormal, the paranormal aspect of the books had a very uh, amoral quality, not immoral. Well, definitely, you could say that was kind of like moral neutral in a sense that that you couldn't really pinpoint if it was something that was beneficial for the characters or in the case of joshua if he was totally like uh pernicious you know like the, you get the sense that the phenomenon is just playing by its own rules and humans just have to cope with that as best they can and whose whose book is darker oh joshua's for sure <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, I guess I guess so. I mean, so yeah, I I do I did agree, resonate with what you said, Miguel. I mean, the the antagonists in my book are, you know, they're they're they probably best be described appropriately enough with the subject matter as being sort of just transactional or you know very uh, mm. contractually minded. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, my my villain, I she doesn't get much screen time, um, but she's probably my favorite character because especially mm. when she does get screen time, now you know it. Um, Time on the page, I guess. Um, but when she does get space on the page, like I, I, I remembered writing that character who was played by Tilda Swinton in my head. Um, and Ooh, how uh, interesting. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, oh, I want to talk about it, but I don't want to give too much away. But uh, let's just let's just say that there's, you know, it, it, you can't top David Bowie as the Goblin King. So what do you do? You get Tilda Swinton, right? I was um, gonna say they're they're the same person. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I remember writing some of her stuff, and it's. Was always the most. I, I did find myself sympathizing with her more. Um, just to just to inject a little bit of a hint of sadness in her character. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I guess mine is. Yeah, I guess mine is darker because his life really does fall apart. I put him through the ringer. So, yeah. so you said the character is is r- roughly based on you. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's 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 everything that's bad about me turned up to eleven. I think. Okay. All right. Um, mm-hmm. would probably be the best way to put it. Um, he's he's me if I didn't get help. <laughs> um, yeah. And and there's some some of the familial some of the family dynamics are extreme dramatizations of some stuff in my extended family as well. Okay. Um, what about but, yeah. other, what about other characters in the story? Were they based on people you knew? Uh, should I, should I take Mike's approach and say? <laughs> <laughs> there's 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 um rick's best friend is is strongly based on someone who i know here in town um okay and uh is just an effervescent presence to be around but kind of um uh what's the right word uh, very fun to be around but also exhausting at the same time mm, okay. <laughs> she was my second favorite character yeah yeah she's she i, I really do love her um so yeah, it's it's it ends up being sort of a, a group of four people that kind of slowly gets whittled down actually over time. Um, but uh, yeah, at the center is Rick Coulter, who unlike me does not play tuba uh, because nobody would believe that a tuba player, <laughs> nobody would believe that a tuba player could make a living on his own in the North Georgia mountains. So he plays guitar. 
Um, <laughs> Wait, you play tuba? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So I, I, I have a non-book related question since we were talking about movies earlier. Have you, Josh, have you watched um, uh, M. Night Shyamalan's daughter's movie, uh, The Watchers? I have not. I heard mixed things about it, but That's I also fair. heard that I should see it. So I have not seen it yet, no. Well, it, it it has a strong Fay stuff running through it, but that's what I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't see that at first. It's not a major spoiler, um, but it's it's interesting the way they dealt with it. And I'm I'm, I'm I, and I have mixed feelings about it. Like I watched it and I enjoyed it, but I'm not sure it was actually that good. <laughs> it was un- it right. was it was unique and it had some interesting ideas. It's just uh, I, I I would love to hear your opinion of it once you get to watch it. I will catch it. One of the wisest things you ever said to me, um, which is literally wisdom that I'm going to pass down to my sons, is that like you know there are things that are bad that you like that. <laughs> Yep. And there are things that are bad that you don't like, and there are things that are good that you like, and there are things that are, that are good that you don't like. You know, I mean, I kind of feel that way with, um, you know, Interstellar. I, I, mm-hmm. I recognized it as being a great film, but it just didn't resonate with me emotionally. Yeah, that that one I really did love. Um, which is doesn't. There's not a lot of movies I love, honestly. <laughs> Usually, I'm kind of like, yeah, that was all right. That didn't suck. You know? The um, you know, because there's so much stuff out there that's just. You've seen it before, especially if you watch a lot of movies. So it's hard to to get something that stands out like Interstellar to me, where it's like, wow, that was really different. I um, have been going through. I realize that my wife has not seen the Mummy films. Oh, okay. <laughs> so mm. we're going back through the Mummy films. And those are fun. It's a blast from the past, I'll tell you what. But uh, what I have finished, um, are, are any of you, I guess I'm probably the only one who really plays that many video games um, among the four of us, but um, there is a studio out of, uh, I believe it's, Oh, it's one of the Scandinavian countries. Forgive me, but it's called remedy and they became famous for uh, max Payne. but um, okay. their subsequent output. Um, the last two book little games that they made um, control and Alan wake. 2. Oh my God. Control um, is one of my favorite games of all time. It's, it's amazing. And there's so much going on beneath the surface. And there's like, I, I found out later that the head of the studio was like big into young, but like there are like collectibles in control that mention like the Sherman ranch. And yes. I think they maybe mention like Ong's hat and some yep, other stuff. Yep. And it's like, wow, these people did their homework. Yes. Yeah. And that's what blew me away about it. Not only is it a really fun game, but the amount of esoteric stuff in there, and like yeah. there's there's one bit where they're talking where where she finds the thing they're talking about a cover story that they're 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 gonna you know put together for whatever event happened or whatever, and it's a real event. Yeah, th- there are aspects of those games that almost feel like a limited hangout. You know, it almost mm-hmm. feels like there's some sort of like truth buried in them. Um, and Alan Wake Two is 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 really good in that respect as well. So um, I, I just got this. So here's here's the irony for for the Ozempic the Ozempic story for when I was sick with Ozempic. I pretty much didn't eat all week. So because groceries cost way too much, I saved a lot of money, and I also <laughs> felt horrible if I did anything but pretty much sit fairly still. And I uh, I had played Alan Wake and initially didn't like it, but once I got into it, I really liked it. And I played like the the little Alan Wake. Uh, download story that was like a shorter thing and i really like that but i'm like i can't spend money on alan wake too i don't really have it but then since i didn't eat for a week i was like i have a little more money because i didn't and it's on sale so i I bought it and i have not gotten very far because it's like you have all this like her her i'm playing the detective at this point and she has the whole like you have to go into her mind castle or whatever it is and right. put all these, I'm like, I don't want to do this part. Like what, what is yeah, this? It, and that is a big frustrating drawback to the game because in some aspects you can't progress unless you get everything onto the, uh, the conspiracy board, so to speak. Um, so I do have some misgivings about it, but, um, you know, I'm the kind I've, of person who, pl- who plays games like three and four times. So I'm like, this is one that I should go ahead and just <laughs> go ahead and buy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I think that I would appreciate. I, I was kind of lukewarm on the first Alan Wake, and I think I would appreciate it much more now that I'm into these topics. Um, but mm. the second one, the second one really does some very. Cool I think it, it, it's a lot more um, coherent okay. <laughs> than the first okay. one. Let's put it that way. I've heard the ending is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm almost there. Almost okay. there. So there, there's some, there's some twists and turns that actually like seem earned and make sense. So it's like, okay, yeah, I'm digging it. Yeah, I just I don't have a lot of time to play games, so usually it's either when I'm too tired to do anything else or 
like in the case of the, the Ozempic incident, I, I couldn't do anything else. So I was like, well, I might as well play video because I played Je- Jedi Survivor for a long time until I, I'm like, yeah, hey, this game is so good and I'm also bored of it. Okay. <laughs> I, gave, I I was big into Starfield for a minute and then I turned around and th- this sounds like I'm just spending all day like playing game, but it's not the case. I just, I cram in an hour whenever I can. You right. Know. Right. Between dinner between dinner and my wife, you know, getting the boys to bed and whatnot. Um, but I played about forty hours worth of Starfield and I wasn't very far and everything started to feel samey and I was like, Okay, well, I guess I came and I experienced some stuff and now I'm gonna <laughs> tap out because I'm just not having fun, right? Well, that's the mm-hmm. thing, and I think also not feeling good didn't help either. Yeah. Um because yeah. the Jedi Survivor game is absolutely amazing. It looks beautiful, it's Everything you could ask for in a Star Wars game. It's also Tomb Raider. I mean, it's literally Tomb Raider with with Star Wars in the Star Wars universe, basically. But yeah, Control, I don't remember who recommended Control to me, but I got it because it had been out for a while. I got it really cheap. And when I started playing it, I was like, yeah, okay, this is fine. But once I really got into it, I was like, there's so much esoteric stuff hidden in this game. It is amazing. Yeah. I, I am extremely surprised that there aren't more people in the paranormal space talking about the remedy studio games because they're right up everyone's alley. Yeah. And it's not just like, not just right up our alley in terms of like, Oh look, neat. It featured a UFO. Like, no, like the ideas that they're engaging <laughs> with are possible solutions <laughs> to, yes. the, to the questions yeah. that we ask. It's wild. <laughs> it is wild. Yeah. Because you have this whole incursion into our reality by this thing. Yeah. Without, I mean, you know, going into spoilers on the game, um, it would make a great movie if well, someone and, did it right or series if someone did it right. I, I would be shocked having being near the end of Alan Wake 2, I would be shocked if there isn't a copy of Eric Wargo's time loops in the remedy office. Like it would be too <laughs> it would be too much of a coincidence for that not to be the case. Um what was I just gonna say? They were saying also about Alan Wake. Nope, I lost it. Okay. I mean, there were supposed to be sequels to Control coming out because um, it did do really yeah. well. Um, but I think they said 2026 or something for the next one or something. Yeah. And, you know, for me, like Alan Wake 2 was a real indulgence for me. Usually I wait and like not only do I buy a generation late, but I like I usually wait for a game to be out for about a year before I pick it up. Yeah. And yeah. Um, but, you know, in this case, it was like, well, this is kind of exactly what I want. I, just <laughs> I got some extra <laughs> I got some extra cash and I'm like, I got to spend it. But um, but yeah. um. You know, the turnaround time on these things is always pretty um, extensive. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, and the thing is, the games for the new new generation systems are so big. Control was so big. And then and then I yeah. don't know if you played the deluxe one, but the Alan Wake stuff is in there. That's what I understand. Um, and I hadn't I played Alan Wake yet. Time. So I'm going, wait, this is the other game that I started and didn't get far into. <laughs> Yeah. But the the download stuff is definitely worth worth getting on control because I, the thing is enormous. Yeah. And now we're and not yeah, talking now, yeah. now we're not talking about your books at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> well. Yeah, there's only a but few. You know, I, I, I haven't seen many. I have, I've been I've been slacking on on movies of this in in this area. So I I figured that might be some common ground <laughs> that we have. And there you go. We did. I, I I also enjoyed the way Oxen Free. Uh, deals with this stuff because that uh, at least the first one, the second one was a little disappointing, but the first one, which you could pick up for like ten bucks or something. I I don't know what this is. So Oxen Free is a dialogue driven game. It's about these okay. kids who go to an island uh, that they're not really supposed to be on, and because they want to experience spooky stuff, and it all has to do with radio transmissions and these like people caught in between realities and it has time loops and all kinds of stuff going on. Huh. In, in fact, the game is a game that you have to play more than once to really get anything out of it because you play through the first time and you end up back where you started, but now everything's a little bit different based on your choices the first time around. Is it all text or is it? No, it's, it, it's, you, it's a, what is some, uh, my sound guy called it a walking simulator. So oh, okay. yeah, you, yeah. you walk around and then like, as you're talking to people, you have to choose your response to them. So there's a few things you have to figure out like puzzle wise. And then a lot of it's just dialogue. It's very good dialogue. And there's just so much. The vibe is just perfect. It really is. The second one, I think they tried to cram too much stuff in, and then I took. I think they took some of it out, and it just feels kind of there. Uh, yeah. but, but the first one, and you don't need to play the second one um, to really get a lot out of the first one. I don't think it was ever meant to have a sequel. I'll have to check it out. And speaking like I, of sequels, yes. <laughs> speaking of sequels, 
Um, oh, we already talked about the possibility of a sequel to The Unseen. Yes, and what about mm-hmm. your book? Does your um, book finish? Th- there's there is the possibility of a sidequel, I guess, okay. um, okay. involving that character that I'm not sure I'm supposed to like. <laughs> um, but you know, everything, everything that happens in, in my novel comes at such a price that it's like, I don't want to see any of these characters regress and I don't want to see any of those costs undermined. So there might be a, a, a opportunity for a prequel slash side cool. But again, if I want it to be about something more than just the monster, like I've got to find an angle for that. And you know, I just don't know at this point if it's the best use of my time. <laughs> so how, how many um, books are you currently working on? About four. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Maybe, maybe depending on, cause I've, I've got a, I've got a solo, a solo venture that I'm working on and I've got uh, about three collaborative projects. And then I have the next two solo projects that I'm working on as I find stuff. I just record it and write it down in my outline. So, you know, <laughs> probably about five or six when you come down to it. <laughs> And there's another um, big project that I'm sort of working on that is way too early to talk about, but might be something completely different in a completely different space too. So um, I'm trying to take this whole thing seriously. <laughs> so we'll okay. see what happens. All right. Well, I know you're working on a collaborative book with uh, Barbara, right? Yes. And I'm, it's, I've, as I've said to her many times, um, you know, Tim, Tim Renner and I were, would often joke about where the footprints end feeling like drinking through a hose, but this project that I'm working on with Barbara is like drinking through the Gulf stream. Um, <laughs> it's just <laughs> because it's, it's, um, flight phenomena, it's right? Flight phenomena. And it, it needed to be written a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but there's a reason that it wasn't written a long time ago because the data set is enormous. I think we're probably dealing with about 600 pages, 700 pages of notes. <laughs> Wow. Uh, notes. Yeah, yeah <laughs> notes. Yeah. Um, so it's it's going to be a multi-volume work. But what's been encouraging about this process so far, you know, every couple of days every week, Barbara and I get together on Skype and we go through the Google document and we try to sort of put this stuff into a shape that we'll have to refine later into the shape of a book. But what's been really encouraging is that we've already started to pull out some trends that I don't think anybody's really noticed before. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's definitely Barbara's project in terms of like, she deserves so much more credit than I do because she put together most of those notes. Um, and she, her insights are just um, fantastic. And yeah. it's it's been a great relationship working with Barbara. Um, but it is the most intimidating thing I've ever done, probably in my entire life. <laughs> so, uh, is there any of these other projects you can talk about? Uh, not right now. Some of them I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, yeah, well, I'll talk more about them later when they're, when they're a little bit more congealed. I'll talk to you guys about them when we, when we hang up. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, no, once we hang up, you we won't be able to hear you anymore. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. Once we <laughs> stop recording. Push the, uh, push the unrecord button. Yeah. Um, Mike, are you working on anything else? He's working on trying to get back into the Skype. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did we lose him? Yes, ages oh. ago. I did oh, not well, it makes, me, makes, me, makes me feel a little bit better about rambling <laughs> nonstop about <laughs> myself. So I don't feel quite as guilty now. He was he, he was so tired of us talking about video games. Um, yeah. Oh, he lost his Wi-Fi. I see. Okay. So, um, well, we're actually out of time. Um, what uh, what's what's Mike's? Where's Mike's thing? Is it hidden experience? I think uh, his main website is mikeclellan.com. Oh, okay. And of course, yeah, hidden experience uh, dot blogspot dot com is still uh, up and people should check it out. And of course, uh, Mike uh, like revived his soul podcast. Yes. yes. The Hidden Experience audio conversations. People can check those out on Spotify and other, you know, yeah. uh, applications where you can check, uh, check out podcasts. Yeah. Podcast really, has it. So yeah. yeah, some really great nuanced conversations that only somebody like Mike can bring to the table. So it's, it's a welcome revival yes it is mm-hmm. and uh miguel where can people find you well they can find me looking for work <laughs> <laughs> uh they can find me at the daily grail dailygrail.com uh and there's plenty of uh cool stuff there not just written by me but also a, a lot of other collaborators and you can they can find my personal website absurdbydesign.com which is kind of like a portfolio where i showcase uh, my graphic work including the cover for books like 
you know, them always never died. And other Har- books, ho- hopefully more of uh, Joshua's future books. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I need to, I need him to write at least two books a year to keep me afloat. At, at, <laughs> at this point, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I, I'm getting to the point. Um, uh, I think when my next, well, Barbara's doing the cover for the Lights book, and um, uh, Matt Festa is doing the cover for my next solo book. But then I'm just gonna start going back to folks that I've worked with in the past, and 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 recycling back through all my favorites. So you're in, you're in the rotation, Miguel. And no, in man. the meantime, other people, please hire Miguel yes. for for stuff because he does he does excellent work, and it was a very enjoyable process. And Josh, where can people find you? JoshuaCutchin.com, J-O-S-H-U-A-C-U-T-C-H-I-N.com. And that's got all the information about all the things I'm doing in my slow descent into madness. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Welcome, buddy. Thanks, yes. All right. I'd like to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons for their support. Without you, this show would not be possible. And I want to give a shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross, John Blackburn, Madeline J, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Marth Artha, Midnight Review Presents, Christine, a blue second-gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain. Patricia Gayaquinta, American Rambler. Andrew Maines. Andrew Malone. Ann Witowski. Barbara Fisher. Beverly Williamson. Illuminati. Bright Rectangle. Charles Davis. Charles in Florida. Land of the Crazy and Communicable. CJ. Corey Nelson. Craig Parmenter. Diane B. MTK. Eric Citron. Eric Todd. History and Coffee. J. J. Otto Bullet. Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, John Hewling, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K., MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Matthew Brown, Sasha McHale, No One, Ole Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Perry Peters, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Roland Belstadt, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Sarah Horgan, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Stacy, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, The Esoteric Book Club Podcast, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Veroche K, Victoria, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, Colin Karras, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very much for the support. All right, there's a pretty lengthy Patreon segment to go with this show, uh, talking about nonfiction stuff with uh, these three. And, uh, yeah, definitely check out their books. And, of course, Josh has a, has a million things coming up. So uh, watch out for that stuff. Uh, again, there's a brand new uh, Where the Road Go website, completely redesigned by Mr. John Tudor, who did an amazing job, and uh, you could, it should everything should work really, really well. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff there, and there's uh, 11 plus years of shows available to you on demand. And uh, if you go into the Patre- if, if if you become a Patreon, you also get access to all the Patreon stuff, and with both Patreon and uh, regular shows combined. There's well over a thousand shows for Where Did the Road Go? And I do want to welcome a couple of new Patreons, uh, Zach Farr and Crazy Man. Uh, So thank you guys for joining up and helping out. Also, thanks to John Ray for a donation. Also, I will be doing a presentation at Ryan Sprague's Anomicon 2024. It's a free um, two-day thing, September 1st and 2nd. So you may be hearing this after uh, that's already there. I assume it'll stay there. So once it's happened, since it is a free thing, it'll probably just stay up. It's www.anomacon.com. That's A-N-O-M-A-C-O-N.com. And I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.